Support for Connecticut East this week comes from Alliance for Living, the only HIV AIDS service organization and resource center in southeastern Connecticut that also deals with homelessness and assists people dealing with substance use disorder. To learn more, including working with us, visit allianceforliving.org. Arisu Anime, New England's premier anime superstore, located in Mystic and a second location now in Fairfield, Connecticut. Visit us at arisuanime, A-R-I-S-U anime.com. Newport Mansions presenting the 19th annual Newport Mansions Wine and Food Festival September 20th through 22nd at Rosecliff. Three days of expert seminars, wine and spirit tastings and an opening night vintner dinner with master chef and author Jacques Pepin. Tickets and information at newportmansions.org. And SCAD, the Southeastern Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, is offering a $3,500 sign-on bonus for licensed clinicians. Go to licensed clinicians.org to learn more. That's licensedclinicians.org. He started his business at the height of the COVID pandemic. Four years on and Marine veteran John Jenner is celebrating success and beating the odds with his laser engraving business. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott Smith. The COVID pandemic was a strange time for all of us. And for those who owned businesses, it was a struggle at first to keep the lights on and the doors open. And for many, it was an opportunity to take advantage of the situation and maybe retire. But it was also a time of creativity as well. And for every business that closed, it seemed a new one sprung up. In fact, according to the Small Business Association, as of 2023, there are over 33 million small businesses in the US, which is 99 0.9% of all firms doing business in the nation and employing around 62 million Americans. John Jenner is one of those success stories. A U.S. Marine veteran and college professor, John was looking for something to do during the pandemic to fill his time and make some money, with schools having gone remote. And turning to his passion for woodworking and design, he took the plunge and started his engraving business, JG Creations. The rest, as they say, is history. And I caught up with him recently in his garage work workshop in the town of Brooklyn to find out more. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So JG Creations, we're going to be talking all about that because it's a phenomenal business. But let's get a little bit of background on you. Uh, We have to say thank you for your service because you are formerly United States Marine Corps veteran, of course, now. Tell us a little bit about that. How did that happen? I decided to go into Marine Corps a couple years after high school and didn't really know what I wanted to do while I went in. And I saw a really cool video where these the Marines are working on helicopters. And I was like, oh, that's that's what I want to do. So I spent eight years in the Marine Corps as an aircraft mechanic working on helicopters and traveling all over the world. And it was a, it's a big part of my life that I'm really proud of and I loved. It says in the bio on your company website that's basically worked with your hands so like really ever since. And obviously it's a passion of yours. Yep. So in the Corps, I was known as an airframer. So I did sheet metal work, fiberglass, and basically think of if, if you were thinking of a car, any of the body panels, interior panels, anything like that. Well, we would fix those on helicopters, including the structure, so the main beams. So I got really good work with my hands, kind of like an artisan, and that's just traveled throughout my life. I'm just a, a hands-on crafty person. So we should say to the listeners, in case they can hear bird song in the background, we are actually in, where it all happens, the garage of your home here in Brooklyn, which is like headquarters for JG Creations, surrounded by lots of high-tech stuff, lots of lasers. There's a very, very big laser actually <laughs> like just behind you. So just talk to us about how you sort of transitioned out of the military into business, because I think that's something that not just for veterans, but it's it's interesting for people as well if they're thinking of wanting to start a business. Yes. Yeah, so I didn't get out because I wanted to, unfortunately. I did get hurt after uh, 2002. So I got separated based on a disability and I didn't know what to do. I was still an aircraft mechanic. I could still technically do my job. So I did for quite a while. And then I moved up to Connecticut when I met my wife and I decided to advance my career, went back to school for engineering and then 
that just blossomed. I spent quite a few years still working as a, in aviation, just doing a different kind of work. Led me down the road of all this technology. So I found uh, we had a laser at work that we use for part marking, and I played around with that, taught myself how to use it. That kind of got me thinking on my home life, like, ooh, I would kind of like to play with one of these at home. And that's kind of where it started. So I bought my first one as a hobby laser. I believe it was 2018, I bought this little hobby laser to play with, and I outgrew it within two months. Realized, this is not the tool for me. I need I need bigger scale, better, more repeatable, higher end machine. So that's kind of where I got to start. And then it just steamrolls after that. Let's talk about the lasers, because I mean, it is a big part of your business. You know, people, we get all these ideas ideas of what we think lasers look like and we're probably all completely wrong like i said there's a very big so like machine behind you which i know is one of your guessing it is the biggest laser but of course none of this can happen without obviously a bit of creativity from you yourself the operator but also software and computers so it's all very high tech isn't it it is and so one of the lasers i want to keep looking at right behind us this is a two foot by three foot bed 100 watt co2 laser so this is my first one this is made for doing wood acrylic leatherette i can do glass. I can do basically every single thing on this laser except for etch metal. Now, the one that's in the blue box over here next to all my computer monitors, that's a fiber laser. That one's primary focus is to engrave into metal. So people will see the different things. They're like, oh, how is that done? Can I do that on this one? Can I do it? And it's like, no, you, there's work on different wavelengths. And that's what determines which laser I'm going to use for the job. But the high tech part of it is that's only part of the job. That's the machine that puts the design down. Where the real magic happens is you have to have the creativity to make your own designs or take what a customer gives you to make them what they want. And I think that's where a lot of my background comes in. As an engineer, I was a tool designer, so I worked in 3D model and software. And of course, going to school, you got to be pretty good at computers to do all your work. So now I design in two or three different programs at a time based on what I'm trying to get out of the product. And I really would say that the people that get into it, a lot of there's a lot of hobby laser engravers out there that are inexpensive, but the people never know, know how to design. So they're stuck with going to Etsy and buying these designs that somebody else did. And that's where the loss happens because they don't know how to manipulate them because that's what you need the software for. So that's where I think I come in with, I can take graphics that somebody gives me and I can modify them, I can update them, or I can start from scratch based on an idea that a customer gives me me. And I think that's kind of how I've grown is people come to me with ideas, but they don't know how to put it down on paper. And I have to extrapolate that from their head and show them something like, oh my God, that's exactly what I was looking for, but I didn't know how to explain it. So that's why I really have fun is it's working with the designs, making the machines hum. That's just practice. It's getting the designs down. That's, you know, kind of exciting. And like I said, it's high tech machinery that it takes a lot of practice to learn it. So business wise, I believe so like JG Creations LLC sort of became official back in 2020. So it's still a relatively young business. Obviously, we're only in 2024, but four years on. How has it been going? Because obviously we hate to keep bringing it up, but obviously the pandemic came along. But, you know, in any business that survives generally Obviously, that's great, you know, when something like that hits. So, you know, how has the four years been? Um, it's been pretty good. Like I said, it started during the pandemic. No lie, this big blue machine showed up. I was teaching at the time. I was a professor at Manchester Community College, and we were on spring break. And that was when they talked about, we're just going to, I think they said, flatten the curve was the words we used. They said, hey, we're going to have spring break, which is typically your week. We're going to add a second week to that, and everybody's going to stay home. I had ordered my laser back in, I believe it was the end of December. Actually, it was right after January 1st, new tax year. I was thinking already, I'm like, new tax year, let's make it happen. So I ordered my laser on January 2nd. I didn't get it until March 15th. It was a Wednesday. I got my laser on a Wednesday when we didn't realize we weren't going back to normal. No kidding. That's when I started. I did all the paperwork. Once April 1st of that year, I did all my paperwork, put in for my LLC, and that's where I started. And it started small. I started by friends and family. Within two months, I was outside of my friends and family into friends of friends. Within the first year, you know, I might have did a few thousand dollar sales, no marketing, no website, no Facebook page just basically word of mouth. And every year I kicked it up and I doubled and doubled and doubled. And last year was a year I decided to quit my full-time job and 
do this full time. And it's been going pretty well. I mean, I'm way outside of my friends and family. I, I do business to business. I had started an Etsy page, which, you know, is not something I really wanted to do, but it's kind of the way people do stuff. So it's a different market line. And, you know, I've sold stuff all the way to California. So I have, you know, my business page, the website, I have my Facebook business page, and then I have my Etsy and it's going really well. And one of the big things I'm proud of that kind of happened this year was I went from like 425 followers on my business page, my Facebook page to, I think I'm four shy of 1300. So I didn't realize that was a big deal until other people made me go, no, that's pretty hard to get over a thousand. So that, I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm, I can't wait to see how that blossoms. That is amazing. As we say, in just four short years, to obviously to like have a, a business success. But like you said, it doesn't come easy, does it? I mean, it is work, work, work. And like you said, you've only just given up a full-time job to turn this full-time. Let me put this question to you. I mean, even though you're a veteran and you're military, was it a bit of a scary thing to, you know, to actually think, right, I'm going to take that final step and I'm just going to, I'm going to do it? Oh, it's still scary. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, um. there's some sleepless nights where I'm like, oh, should I go back to my engineering job or should I go back to teaching? But I'm in this full feed. It's a family decision. You know, my wife and I have a lot of discussions about this and she can coach me highly. She knew my passion. She saw what the, the happiness it brought me. It's scary. It's still scary because I'm at a point now where I'm actually starting to do a lot more marketing and trying to become a salesman. I can run my machines and, and design, but the salesman part, I'm not a born salesman, but I have passion. And I think that's what comes through is I'm selling the passion that I have for my craft. But it's still a scary one every day going, I got two boys. I have a 10 year old and a 15 year old that, you know, I'm thinking about college and I'm like, boy, uh, I'm leaving a lot on the table right now, but no, it's, it's, it's exciting still. So it gives you that drive. I know that I don't sit on my hands. I work all the time. But it's different when you're happy doing what you do. Looking around as well, I mean, you've got some of the, the things that you're obviously working on here. You work across a phenomenal range of materials. I'm looking at slate. I'm looking at wood. I'm looking at metal. I'm also looking at fabric as well. There's some hats in front of us. There's some T-shirts. Is there anything that you don't print, engrave or whatever it is on? Right now, the biggest thing that I turn away is glass. Only because there's another type of laser that I really truly want to buy, but it's a, it's a capital investment and I'm just not ready to jump into it yet because it's a kind of a niche laser. It's a UV laser. So right now I can technically do glass on my CO2, but I am very much a man of quality. If it doesn't look perfect, I'm not selling it. I am not happy with the way glass comes out of, a, of the CO2 laser because most people are used to seeing glass that's either been sandblasted is what most people are used to seeing. Or if you get into the higher end crystal glasses, those are actually cut with, um, I think they use a, it's a machine and I'm not exactly sure how they fracture the glass. That's where I just, I don't have the right machine to make it the quality I want, so I won't do it. But you did mention t-shirts. This The t-shirts and hats in front of you is a brand new venture. This started less than six weeks ago. I made the leather patches that you can see on this hat, which is, uh, this is a truck hat with a leather patch. Well, I was doing the leather patches already. And then somebody's like, hey, you really got to put those on a, on a hat, sell hats. So that's kind of how that started. And then somebody saw our hat and then a business saw it. Next thing you know, I've got cases of these being ordered. So I stepped up my game and got an industrial hat press. One of the customers who ordered the hat said, you know, I'd really love to order t-shirts. Can you do those? And I was like, I don't have a t-shirt press, nor do I really know how to do it, but let me educate myself and I'll figure it out. Lo and behold, I did. And then I had this big flat press you see with a couple more laser beams. That one there is for doing T-shirts. I could do backpacks, all kinds of stuff. Basically anything fabric. And what you're looking at is what most people think of as screen printing. That's what these shirts are. So that whole screen printing process has revolutionized where it's not the old rubber mat with the ink and all that. They can do this now where they print that ink onto a transfer medium and it's put on with heat and it takes away all that gooey mess. So... That's the new venture I just started. I did a minor press release on Facebook, just like a quick one minute video. In the next month or two, I'm going to be redoing my whole website to really capture all the different things I'm doing and show people like, hey, I can do apparel, I can do cups and water bottles, cotton boards, 
I can engrave parts from manufacturing facilities, encapsulate all that information at once. Because obviously personalizing stuff, I mean, it is a it is a big business. I mean, I'm just looking at that laser that you were talking about that does the screen printing, as it were, but the high-tech version. It looks like a very high-tech ironing board. You just can't imagine how, you know, these things just like come out. It's obviously the engineer in you, isn't it? You know, you were saying about, you know, you want to get the UV laser if you decide to go on and do the, the glass. So, I mean, that's, that's a great attitude to have, to know that a business thinks that highly the owner of the business thinks that highly that he just won't do something unless it can be done because these things aren't cheap either are they no they're not and i don't you know you got to spend money to make money I, that's you know i always learn that through engineering but there's a lot of product that i've made that i've thrown away burnt whatever while i was learning a craft and that's where I'm very, very nitpicky. If you talk to my wife, she will laugh and tell you, and this isn't meant to be a dig at anybody, but I throw away stuff that is the same quality of the stuff you find at the craft fairs. So my junk pile can be a crafter's sellable item. And that's not a dig at a crafter because I've been there, but I just, I come from a mindset where working in manufacturing where there was machining and stuff, it has to be perfect. If it's not perfect, you can't sell it to the customer. And I guess that's followed me into my own business where sometimes I have to be like, okay, that's really not bad. <laughs> but if it's not what I want, then it goes in a scrap pile and, and that's just how it is. I think that goes down to the fact that that's a price point for people. We can't always afford, you know, the most expensive expensive thing so if there are other levels and i think that you know that's in all sorts of businesses so it's great to know that you know you can come to a business and like you said you can go to a crafter and you can get a certain quality at a certain price point because they're just not going to be able to sell it any at any higher a price because you know you as the consumer but like you said when it comes to something like the hats i mean i'm looking again at the hat it is beautifully designed the hat is is a very gorgeous green it's like mesh hat but the the leather patch is absolutely stunning i mean it's got a cow on there it's got the name of the organization in in woodstock as well that just looks super professional and yeah that's the type of thing that you expect if you maybe contacted one of these other so like printing shops etc so no it, it absolutely is a quality thing isn't it talk to us about the challenge coins we were just because uh, i was looking at your website like i said you do all sorts of things people in the military will know what a challenge coin is so quickly explain to us about that but you use it for other purposes as well Yep. So a challenge coin, like you said, is military. First responders as well. You know, a lot of police officers, firefighters are recognized. But a challenge coin is basically about an inch and a half diameter coin that's roughly an eighth of an inch thick. Very heavy duty. And from the military side, we had like our squadron. It'd be like our squadron logo and, and just motivational stuff. When you're traveling around, you would share these with other people. The whole tradition of challenge coins goes back just a long time where it, it was a joke when you had to keep in your pocket if you go to a bar somebody would smack one down and everybody better have that challenge coin to smack down or else you were buying that was how i heard the whole challenge coin story nowadays people use them as commemorative pieces and share it and i've got them you know all over the place from different people i've met in my life but uh yeah i started doing those with my fiber laser and it's a very time consuming process so most people see these coins and they see these really brightly colored they're enamel paint and stuff and those are beautiful but what they don't understand is those are made by the thousands. So there's a tool that was built to strike them and then somebody hand paints them. What I'm doing is I'm one at a time, 20 minutes per side and graving down that depth. And, you know, so it takes a little while to make them. But if a customer wants a small order, they only want 20 or 30 or 10 or 100. It seems expensive when you go to buy one. However, if you had to go to a manufacturer, it would be way more money. So it's just getting people to understand that, yes, this isn't a $10 item. One of these one-offs could be a $50 coin, but it's not one of those things that it's it, it, people know that are into it. But the funny story is the one I was showing you earlier is I actually engraved it with my business logo. And on the back, I put my QR codes from my website, my Facebook page, and use it as kind of like a business card at times. It's a special one. I mean, if I met a, cl a potential client or somebody I just wanted to share something special with, but I'm not handing that out like a paper business card. Exactly. And I mean, and let's 
let's face it, you're, you're showing off the work that you do and the quality of the work, because I had a look at that, and it is, again, phenomenal. It's a beautifully designed coin. And yeah, having the QR codes, I've never seen actually a challenge coin with QR codes on the back, so that was fascinating to look at. Where do you go from here? Like we said, it's a four-year-old business, turning out amazing products, and your name is out there. What do you think you want to do in the next, you know, two, three, four years? Uh, the next big step is figuring out, getting out of my, my garage into an actual shop. It's a pride point for me. I can do great quality work in here, but I feel like I'm missing the mark. If I bring customers in, I'm like, well, it's not what I consider a manufacturing facility or a ward shop. I want that. The big question is going to be, is am I going to be on Main Street USA or am I going to be on my own property? And I'm leaning more towards my property because I can put a beautiful establishment on my land and do everything from my property, which allows me to work the kind of hours that I want to work and still have all that same business. I think COVID really changed the way that people shop. And this kind of work is not typically walk in and talk to the owner or to the whoever's running the machines. A lot of it's done through email and phone calls. So to spend $2,000 a month for rent, well, that's all coming off the bottom line. So why not just do it on my property and pay my own mortgage on my shop and maximize my earning potential and still be able to have my customers come because I'd still have a showroom. I'd still have all my machines. Everything would just be set up exactly the way that I want it built. And that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Just quickly looking back, it's a $64 million question, I suppose. Just looking back over the last four years, would you have done anything different or are you happy about the route that you took? Hmm, that's a good question. I've kind of lived this life right now as a buy once, cry once scenario. I made a mistake with my first laser that I bought. It was too small, it wasn't repeatable, and I just wasn't happy with it. I spent too much money on it, but fortunately I was able to sell it and get back most of my money. Even though I did a ton of research, I thought I did the right thing. That was probably one of my biggest regrets. Other than that, I mean, not really. I think I let it start the way I wanted it to. It started as, honestly, I needed something to do during the summertime when I wasn't teaching. And I, my boys were home and I was like, oh, this will be a fun family business. I can make a couple extra dollars and see what happens. So I never really intended this to be a full-time business. I thought I would do this until I retired from teaching and then... I would have my retirement job, in all honesty. And I'm only 50, so it's not like I expected it to be the way it was. But family stuff changed. My wife and I changed roles, and I said, I'm doing this full time. And it might have been a little early, but I think it was the right decision. So I do not regret it, and I can't wait to see where the future takes it. Because, like I said, my name is starting to get known, and we have some very prominent local businesses here. And... I'm very honest with them, and I and I talk to those owners as well. I'm like, I'm not trying to take any of your business. I'm trying to do different stuff than you do. But if you need a hand, there's a couple of businesses that share with me. They're like, hey, I can't do this, but John can. Go talk to JG Creations, and, and I'll do the same thing. I have no problem sending somebody. If I can't do it to the quality that needs to be done, I will send them to another local business because it's all about keeping it local. Yep, small business, as they say. It may sound cliche, but it absolutely is the truth. It is the backbone of America, and you are showing why. That continues to be a strong backbone. Continued success, John. Thanks for talking to us. And we look forward to seeing where JG Creations goes in the next few years. But in the meantime, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And if you're interested in the products and services that John offers, then head over to his website at jgc-engraving.com for details. Connecticut East this week is made possible by... Alliance for Living, the only HIV AIDS service organization and resource center in southeastern Connecticut that also deals with homelessness and assists people dealing with substance use disorder. We are currently seeking a finance and grants coordinator to join our team. Those with grants management experience and a passion for the work we do in the community are encouraged to apply. For full job description and benefits, as well as other open positions, visit allianceforliving.org. Arisu Anime, a Japanese pop culture Haven nestled in Mystic and Fairfield, specializing in anime and manga merchandise featuring an integrated Japanese convenience section designed to mirror Tokyo's vibrant streets. Arisu offers an immersive shopping experience complete with towering statues and authentic capsule machines. Whether you're a seasoned collector or a curious newcomer, Arisu invites you to explore a world where fantasy and reality merge at Arisu Anime. That's A R I S U Anime.com. Newport Mansions 
first seen on HBO's The Gilded Age. Newport Mansions preserves and protects 11 historic properties and landscapes in Newport, Rhode Island, exemplifying three centuries of achievements in American architecture, decorative arts, and landscape design. Plan your visit this year and attend some of the mansion's signature events, including the Newport Flower Show June 21st to 23rd, Newport Mansions Wine and Food Festival September 20th to 22nd, and holidays at the Newport Mansions November 23rd to January 1st. Tickets and information at newportmansions.org. And... SCAD. The Southeastern Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence is looking for licensed clinicians and is offering the top benefits packages in the state. Go to licensedclinicians.org to learn more. That's licensedclinicians.org. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week. A rare double-stemmed corpse flower has bloomed with not one but two flowers at Eastern Connecticut State University recently. The corpse flower, which is the world's smelliest flower, is one of two clones that belong to the school and flowers around every two to three years. But as Brian Connolly, associate professor of biology at Eastern, says, they think this rare double stem may have been the result of his team trying to repot the plant and accidentally damaging it. That looks like two inflorescences and I've never seen that out of one corn before. I'm not sure if, you know, us cracking it stimulated it to make two meristems, which are the growth centers, or what happened. I haven't dug down and I, I don't know how they're connected exactly, but but I've never heard of two inflorescences coming from one leaf. Conley says because the plants have become so rare in the wild, cultivators like Eastern and across the U.S. have started a network to help maintain a strong gene pool for the future. Chicago Botanic Garden has a stud book, and so like tigers or giraffes or gorillas in zoos, you don't want them to be inbred because it decreases the long-term survival. So I took clippings of our two clones and I sent them to be genetically sequenced. And so we kind of have a family tree of the different plants. The corpse flower is listed as endangered with fewer than 1,000 individuals remaining in the wild. It originally comes from the islands of Indonesia. A massive 50-foot mural depicting three pioneering women has been unveiled on the side of a downtown parking garage in the town of Willimantic. The three women are acclaimed novelist Tony Morrison, Eastern Connecticut State University President Elsa Nunes, and former state governor Ella Grasso. The project is based on a famous mural in Spain called Unity is Strength, depicting several influential women from around the world, as Matthew Vertfoyle, Secretary of Wyndham Public Art, explains. They featured women who succeeded despite their gender and it includes the tagline which you see up there in Spanish which in English translated means capabilities don't depend on your gender. It featured important women like Billie Jean King, Nina Simone, Frida Kahlo, Rosa Parks, Angela Davis and more. A local historian helped determine the subjects for the mural with Nunes, the first selection due to her impact on the Willimantic community as president of Eastern University for the last 18 years. In her speech, Nunes recalled how the local community of Willimantic and Eastern had bad relations when she took over all those years ago and how she wanted to turn that around and leave a positive legacy behind. She said she and her team have achieved that and in an emotional speech said she doesn't feel like she should be on the mural. I was so touched and I, I feel like I don't deserve this. I really don't deserve to be in the... If the Grasso family is here, I don't deserve to be next to her. And Toni Morrison, you know, the literary scholar from Princeton, and it's like, you did this, and I feel so humbled by it. I feel like I'm not in that league. But in a way, I'm retiring, and what I feel is that you have validated me that the work that I did all these years meant something to you. Nunez is the first Latina university president in New England. Grasso was the first woman governor in Connecticut. And Morrison is a Nobel Prize winning author and the first black female editor at Random House. She spent most of her life in the Northeast. And an iconic cat-themed coffee shop has taken the unusual step to become a non-profit as a way to leave a lasting legacy for the local community. Two Razzling Cats based in East Haddam has been granted non-profit status and owner Mark Thede says he wanted to leave his business to his kids but as they have other directions in their lives than running his business decided on this plan instead. Now been designated the Two Razzling Cats Accord which will be a non-profit that will support programs in inclusion, 
the LGBT community, racial justice, women's reproductive freedom, the welfare of cats, in particular the capture, spaying, and neutering of cats, and preservation of local history, archaeological digs here. Didi says he had no idea how successful he would be in hopes by creating a foundation for the future and keeping the coffee shop in the community. It might resonate with other business owners in the state who may be in the same position. That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at Connecticut-East.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East This Week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. I'm Brian Scott Smith. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 